Hey guys, welcome to the 14th episode of the Blue Deck Podcast. I'm your host, Joseph Mazarak. If you're tuning in for the first time, you've picked a good place to hop in. During our regular season shows, we've been going through my book, Into the Attic of the World, one chapter at a time. But today, we are about to play all the season one chapters, that's chapters one through nine, back to back, uninterrupted to help you get ready for the start of season two. That being said, if you like what you hear, please go back through our catalog, particularly the off-season shows. They have interviews with my dear friend Dalen Woods that provide behind-the-scenes insights into my life as an imaginative person and my creative process, so that might be interesting. Reminder to all, Into the Attic of the World is a work of fiction, copyright 2019 by Joseph Mazarak. that's me. Any similarities to persons living or dead, unless stated implicitly, are purely coincidental. Same goes with the places. For all copyright information, please visit our home on the web, thebluedeck.com. Now I present for your listening enjoyment, Into the Attic of the World. Into the Attic of the World, Chapter 1, Charles Miller I was barely a teenager when magic first touched my life. Those days were so much like dreams, with their strange wanderings and incredible wonders, it's difficult to believe they actually happened. I've tried to forget, but the past is like a lion in the way it patiently hunts for the present. After all these years, I guess it's finally caught up to me. A few months ago, I bought my old child at home. That might have been a terrible mistake, because the memories have come back stronger than they have in years. Even as I write this, when I close my eyes and visited by visions from other worlds, I see broken bones of shipwrecks sunken in sand, and the drifting shapes of ghosts too scared and wayward to face judgment. I recall the stolid face of a king on his blue throne, and the radiance of a girl so beautiful I fell in love just by looking at her. I suppose I can deal with that, but today is a good day. On the bad days, I see dead friends and a terrible black unicorn with his horn dripping blood. Through the rational eyes of adulthood, I know what I remember is impossible, but here's the paradox. Even impossible things can happen when magic cuts holes in the world. I'm trying to prepare you, but in a way I'm doing a disservice because this story isn't about unicorns. It's not about ghosts, shipwrecks, or kings. It's not even about falling in love. Most of that comes later. This story is about me as a boy and how I became first mate on a crew of kids led into another world by, well, the captain. You'll meet him soon enough. Before I introduce you to him, however, I have to show you around my own neighborhood. In the summer of 1990, my family lived on a long, skinny lake, with townhouses built on one side and a wetlands forest on the other. This was in Florida, so the waterline was constantly visited by wildlife, mostly ducks and other more exotic-looking birds like egrets, but also the occasional deer or alligator. One morning, I was on the back porch sitting in the kind of chair that looks like wood, but it's really made of plastic. You know, the ones, beachy-looking things with low, sloped bottoms? There were no deer or alligator that morning, just ducks waddling along the paved lakeside path. I was not interested in ducks. Instead, I sat watching the water, letting my mind drift out like fishing line. Then I saw something interrupt the bright blue sheet of reflected sunlight. What was it? I couldn't tell and wouldn't be able to for several hours. I took a mental note that breakfast had passed and lunch was still a ways off. The time specifically didn't matter. It was summer, and in summer time was as bendy and stretchy as the waistband of my underwear. My mother leaned out the sliding door, saying something, but I ignored her. Not that I meant to do that. It's just concentration is tricky for all boys, and particularly difficult for a thirteen-year-old. It seemed every moment I was thinking of a dozen things at once, or absolutely nothing. Either that, or my brain, every gooey gray wrinkle, was focused one hundred percent on a single subject, all interruptions banned forthwith upon pain of death. She waited for an answer. Well, she asked. 
I groaned. Victor said he saw Bigfoot again. I said it was bogus, and he started crying. Be nice, Charles. Every time he goes home crying, I get a phone call. That's not my fault. She waved for me to come to her. It is if you're not being nice. Your shirt's inside out, and it's too hot for long sleeves. Gee, son, who taught you how to dress? She pulled me inside the house. Change your clothes, and I want you to read a book today. Your brain's turning to mush. Ah, oh, do I have to? But I was already darting up the stairs. As I changed into a t-shirt, I happened to look out my bedroom window. On the distant side of the lake, I spotted again that strange disruption. This time, it was somewhat closer, or maybe my angle was better to see it, because I could make out its shape, vaguely triangular, and its size, difficult to say exactly, but roughly the height of my bedroom door. I stepped closer to the window, peeking out the open blinds. Was the shape moving? I thought it was. A knock came on the back door, which immediately set my dog Chimney barking up a storm. I raced down the stairs to find one of the neighborhood boys, Ozzy Ernesto, pressing his greasy forehead to the glass. I'd hoped to see William, but Ozzy would have to do. Mom gripped Chimney by the collar as I pushed through the back door. I had to get out of the house quick before she gave me something to do. She'd already threatened me with a book. Unlike my best friend William, Ozzy shifted the focus of his friendship between me and my brother every few years. He'd started out as my friend back in our dinosaur phase, but had followed my brother into He-Man, stuck with him for a short while into Star Wars, and ditched that to play backyard football with me. I suspected he was about to switch loyalties again because he was into video games and my little brother had a Nintendo in his bedroom. Maybe not, though, because one thing Ozzy and I had in common was our love of baseball. Ozzy's favorite player was Jose Canseco, a Cuban-American like himself, and my favorite was Mark McGuire. Where was Tommy, I wonder, when all this was going on? Probably upstairs, preparing an epic conquest of the Galactic Empire. He had a million action figures, including the previously mentioned He-Man Barbarians. But more than anything else, the boy had stormtroopers, great armies of them. So, in the absence of Tommy and William, Ozzy and I played out on the back lawns. We threw the football around, and later played that stupid hand-slapping game. We stood facing one another, our palms touching. Ozzy would give me a false start, fake out, and then whack! He was a crazy fast slapper. By the time I finally dodged him and we switched positions, the back of my hand was fiery red and stinging. After that, Ozzy and I just wandered around, arguing over the merits of Victor's Bigfoot sightings. In my view, Victor was only ten, an unreliable witness, and a crybaby to boot. I didn't believe a word he said. Ozzy, on the other hand, liked the idea of a seven-foot-tall, hairy monster living in the forest behind the lake. He said it would be like Harry and the Hendersons or something, but if you wanted to convince me, you should have referenced Chewbacca instead. At some point, Don joined us. She was breathtaking, blonde hair with curls and big brown eyes like pools of honey, that sort of thing. I was infatuated with her, and so was everybody else. I tried not to be a jerk about it, because, along with being pretty, she was one of my best friends. She had a little sister, Layla, but Layla was only six and mostly rode her big wheel up and down the pathway, her plastic wheels constantly knocking against the spaces in the pavers. Talk, 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 talk. I still remember that sound. Then, after a while, we returned to my porch. Ozzy and I lounged on the beach chairs while Don stood over us, the three of us chatting about who knows what. Then out of the blue, the plastic wheels of Layla's big wheel screeched to a halt, and she shouted out, It's a boy! That phrase, it's a boy, brings to mind a delivery room, a doctor in blue scrubs holding a slimy, crying baby. Of course, that's not what Layla was referring to, but in a sense, the boy's arrival was a lot like a birth, because up until that very morning, I'm not even sure he existed, at least not in our world. He piloted a raft across the lake. The triangular shape I'd seen from my bedroom was its sail. 
To be clear, ours was a skinny lake, not much good for boating, and the only other watercraft we'd seen on it were boats from the wildlife service. Their people came out on occasion when neighborhood mothers complained about alligators. But the wildlife service only employed men with beards, not boys, and they took to the water in john boats with gas engines, not rafts with sails. The boy stood alongside his sail, one hand gripping the mast post. The raft itself was barely visible above the water line. A breeze washed across the lake, and the sail billowed, catching the air like a kite in the wind. The boy took the sail by its lower crossmember, leaned back, his right leg stretching to dip toes into the water. The raft turned, one of its corners peeking up into the air like the face of a curious fish. No one spoke. We only watched, amazed. Then, as the approaching craft slowed, the boy lifted his hand into the air and waved to us. I waved back. We all did. When the raft came near to the bank, perhaps ten feet from land, the stranger loosened the cords on the mast, and the sail dropped limp against the post like a flag on a windless day. The boy seemed so efficient at his seafaring duties, by comparison we were less than amateurs. In a minute flat he had the sail totally removed and folded into a box. Then he lifted the mast from its mount on the floor, turned it sideways, and out slid a staff, slim like a broomstick. He laid the mast across the wooden deck, and used the smaller staff to guide the raft in slowly turning circles in the shallow water. When I first thought of this as an adult, I compared it to a dream— but later I concluded that watching the boy drift circles through the sunlight reflections was less like a dream and more like an old Disney movie, like the kid in the jungle book floating down the river on the belly of a bear. Half like that, and half Peter Pan drifting in through an open window, I almost expected to see a fairy alight upon his shoulder, sprinkling his shirt with fairy dust. The boy peered into the water, the prodding of his stick rippling the surface, then the slow talk 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 the plastic wheels over pavers lifted the scene from the cartoon realm and on to the familiar face of reality layla stopped her big wheel in front of me she sat astride the three-wheeler her arms resting across the handlebars and her knees bobbing side to side her left knee was scraped and she wore her white church shoes i don't know why i remember that so clearly the boy on the raft looked like a homo figurine come to life his skin was porcelain white with cheeks so rosy they looked painted his eyes were a perfect caramel gold and his auburn hair although messy waved and tumbled with friendly indifference he wore trousers rolled up nearly to his knees a plaid shirt short-sleeved shirt and a khaki vest with all kinds of peculiar patches sewn on to it he also wore a knife and a leather scabbard on his belt. The thing had a handle made of bone. To me, that was most impressive and very interesting, but at the same time, a flag of warning. By this time, Ozzy, Donna, and myself were all standing near the water. Ozzy piped up, "'Who are you?' The boy on the raft looked surprised by the question. He placed an innocent hand across his heart. "'Me? Some people call me Captain Kidd, but I'm nobody, just a boy on a raft.' "'Where'd you get it?' Ozzy asked. "'This old thing,' the boy tapped the wooden floor with his staff. "'I didn't get it. I built it. You know, from logs and such.' Amazement colored Don's voice. "'You built that? Can I ride it?' "'You bet,' the stranger replied. "'Now hold on,' I said to Don. "'You don't know this guy from Adam. Any raft built by a kid will sink, I bet.' I looked at the boy with suspicion. "'What school do you go to?' "'What do you mean?' he asked. You know, Argyle Forest, Orange Park. Did you move from out of state? My hands have become fist, and I wasn't sure why. Where do you go to school? It's an easy question. Then Ozzy, speaking as if the boy wasn't standing, or rather floating, right in front of us, said to me, He's probably too young, probably goes to elementary. I looked at the seafarer. Well? Well what? he asked. Do you go to elementary school? That foul place! I'd rather fight a dragon than go there! He brought the staff up, whirling it between his hands in mock battle. His stomping feet cast a raft about wildly, but it didn't tip or sink. In fact, it looked rather well made and would likely hold Don easily, or all of us for that matter. Layla was not entirely won over. From her seat on the big wheel, she said with perfect certainty, There's no such thing as dragons, and any boy who doesn't go to school will be dumb as a post before long. 
not a bad retort for a six-year-old. The boy on the raft spun the staff between his fingers, gripped it in the center, then brought it down solidly under the decking. Quite right, my dear. That's why I insist upon the finest education possible. Where'd he go to school, then? Ozzie asked. Why, the boy replied, out in the deepest jungles of Africa, for starts. Then off to Burma, New Guinea, and West Texas. I've even been tutored by a mummy once. The boy spoke with such enthusiastic confidence it was hard not to buy into the lunacy. So, world traveler, I sneered, what brings you to these humble waters? The boy sighed. Hmm, I'm glad you asked. By chance, have any of you earned any merit badges of late? He looked at our blank faces. You know, patches? He presented the many patches sewn onto his vest for evidence. Like from the scouts? Don looked at each of us in turn before admitting, No, we haven't. I was in the Girl Scouts, but that was years ago, and no, no, the boy cut in, not from the scouts. What about besides that? Still, we shook our heads. The boy rubbed his chin, as suspected. Hmm, what new skills have you learned? He waited for our answers. Don pointed to her little sister. Layla can ride a bike with no training wheels. That's something, the boy said. He pointed to me. What about you? I shifted my stance. For some reason, I felt like I'd done something wrong. Out of my mouth popped the first thing I could think of. I learned to tie on fish hooks. The captain studied my face. How many times do you twist the line around itself before running it back through the hoop? Was this a quiz now? Seven times, I said, triumph lifting my voice. That should do it. The boy paced the short length of the raft. Then suddenly he snapped his fingers. We need snacks to clear our heads. But what the boy considered snacks, I thought of as a picnic feast. That was the first time I ever ate lobster. Consider the scene, and pay attention because there are a few important details I don't want you to miss. First, the arrival of the food truck. It pulled up to the neighborhood gazebo just as us kids were settling in around the shaded picnic table. Had anyone called it? No. Did it regularly stop there? No. In fact, it never stopped there. Never before and never again. That was the way of things when Captain Kidd was around. Things just showed up or went away or changed slightly to fit his fancy. And the food truck was no ordinary taco stand on wheels. Oh, no, it was some kind of reconfigured military vehicle. A Mercedes. It had no business on the North American continent, much less in our little subdivision. Also, the men who drove it and made the food had skin as dark as black coffee and spoke English, but with accents too thick to fully understand. I thought of them as islanders, though what made me think that, I'm not quite certain. Maybe it was something in a movie I'd seen. They shoveled out the food for us, as much as we could carry on paper platters, lobster tails and shrimp, rolled up taquitos, and fried sugary treats on sticks. Lots of fruit, too, and firecrackers. I suppose the firecrackers were their version of Happy Meal toys. All of this was paid for by the boy, who seemed to think nothing of it. He paid the food truck islanders and large coins from a leather pouch. This could be wrong, but I think the coins were Morgan Silver Dollars. By this point, we were all amazed by the kid. How could we not be? But here's the second detail to take away from the encounter before we get into the matter with the patches. Captain Kidd had a way of making a person look at himself with a critical eye, and not necessarily in a good way, which I suspect contributed to the way he made enemies. Any two people get in a room together, and they'll inevitably draw comparisons. My friend, Captain Kidd, set the bar too high. Some people just couldn't accept their abilities, being so meager next to his. I know that's not a good way to look at it, but it's human nature. So, when I saw him usurping my position as the leader of our little neighborhood gang, I didn't like it. That was my weak spot, my pride, the chink in my youthful armor. Still to this day, I don't like lobster. I've no doubt this memory is the reason why. But let us not linger here in negativity, because my mistrust of the boy was not motivated entirely by selfishness. I loved my friends, and trust is earned. Now, enough of that. Come with me and learn of the patches. Chapter 2 Patches 
Captain Kidd sat cross-legged atop the picnic table. The rest of us were gathered round him on the benches, our fingers sullied and smelling of the juicy seasoning in the lobster tails. Looking down at the many patches sewn upon his vest, the captain asked, "'Honestly, you don't know of these? Whenever you do something new, like something really special or hard, you earn patches from the patch fairy. She leaves them under your pillow.' He looked to us for confirmation, checking to make sure we weren't playing a trick on him. To him, earning patches must have been the most obvious thing in the world, like getting french fries at McDonald's or presents at Christmas. But when he saw our unknowing expressions, he understood that wasn't the way of things in Jacksonville, Florida. His eyes squinted suspiciously, and then softened as he tapped his chin. He looked each of us over, fixing his amber eyes on me last. No merit patches for you, either. Not ever. Turning a black cat firecracker in my sticky fingers, I said, No, with all seriousness. Surely you use patches at night? That isn't the problem, is it? I smirked. We use pillows, just no patches. The young captain scratched his head. I don't suppose you'd look for patches if you've never heard of them. But even without looking, you'd come upon them eventually. Don gestured to the boy's chest with a fried sugary stick in her hand. The Patch Fairy gave you all those? She did, he said, and many more than just these. She pointed. What's that one for? The captain examined a square patch, deep blue, with a snarling bear embroidered onto it. It was one of his more menacing patches. It's for facing a grizzly bear at night and keeping my wits. He fingered the circular patch next to it. On it, a river flowed left to right in the shape of a swooping letter S. This is for learning all the major rivers of the world, their names, and the countries they cross. He moved to the next one, an old-fashioned feather pen and ink bottle. That's for calligraphy. Then the next. This one's quite rare, I'm told. The patch was thinner than the others and tall, a blue line with a little red at the very bottom, for helping catch a very wicked person. He looked up at Don, then to the rest of us. He had a somber look, which is to say he was neither smiling nor frowning. Don must have said something wrong because she touched his knee. What is it? she asked. He looked at her hand, then forced himself to smile. It wasn't a happy smile, but a brave one. The patch fairy is missing. I'm afraid something bad has happened, but I don't know where to look for answers. He climbed down off the table, and turning to the lake, he propped his hands on his narrow hips. Holding the pose, he stood that way for what felt like a long time. At last he said, This lake looks familiar. I wonder. What? I asked. The captain looked at me. Does the path go all the way around the lake? No, I said. It leads to the pool and basketball courts. He nodded. What if you're not going to the pool or basketball courts? Does it continue around the lake and into the woods? Sure, I said. There's a walkway that goes over the creek to another part of the neighborhood. My mom and dad go that way on their bikes. At the mention of my parents, the captain, how can I describe it? The fact that we were kids meant we were his kind of folk, but having parents meant we were also quite different. Honestly, it was as if he expected us to all be orphans or some other version of humans in a world without grown-ups. Never mind, the people in the food truck were middle-aged men. After taking in this new bit of information, like a sea captain adjusting for a change in wind speed, he turned again to the lake and said, We should go that way to see if the shuttle's still there. Might be gone, though, or stolen, or sunk. Then to me, you didn't happen to see a shuttle in the woods, did you? What, like a bus? Rather than answering my question, what he said next withdrew our invitation to go with him. I'll check if it's still there. Maybe Marsha Rabin borrowed it. Then his mood brightened. I guess I'll see you later. I'll be back tonight if I'm able. Without another word, he waved a quick goodbye and left us to clean up the mess we'd made of the picnic table. Even in summer, on weekdays, my bedtime was 9.30, so after dinner I was in a rush to get outside. Something new was happening, something special. I could feel it even if I didn't understand what it was. So, out on the backyard lawns, I met my friends. They trickled out as soon as their dinners, chores, or showers would allow it. This time I was joined by my little brother Tommy. William, my best friend, was waiting for us when we rushed out into the backyard. Heather and Asa came out next. Victor and Diego a little later, all these people were about my age, which is to say, they were either approaching their teenage years or they'd recently crossed over. 
Earlier in the day they'd heard about our morning visitor, and now they wanted to see him for themselves, possibly even take a ride on his sailing raft, and if nothing else, they came to crack off the fireworks we'd got at the captain's picnic. A few other kids came and went. Along the pathway, grown-ups passed by walking their dogs, but other than looking up and shaking their heads when the fireworks exploded, they paid us no mind. The kids who gathered to meet the mysterious sailor waited a long time, but eventually wandered off, certain we'd made up the story out of boredom. My little brother William and Victor, he was a Bigfoot spotter, were the first to go back inside. Layla headed in around eight. I understood why she left, she was so young, but Ozzy gave up on the captain just after she did. William, Don, and I stayed out on the back porch until our parents threatened our lives if we didn't give up the night watch. So, like the rest, we surrendered and went inside. As I pulled the sliding door closed behind me, I felt like I was closing myself off to a world of wonderful possibilities. The door sealing up the night alerted me to how noisy the evening air had been, when before I thought of it as quiet. Confined in the stillness of the living room, with my dad looking up from the couch, a remote in his hand and the TV muted, I realized what real silence was. Charles, I was calling you for ten minutes. Dad never had a bad temper. He wasn't that kind of guy, but upsetting him, especially around bedtime, could mean an early bedtime the next day, or chores, or even getting yelled at. Sorry, Dad, I said. He looked to the door. Close the blinds is like living in a fishbowl. As I tugged the vertical shut, he asked me, What were you guys doing out there? I shrugged. Don't know. Talking, I guess. Not a good excuse, but I did or something had stopped me from mentioning the boy in his raft. That same thing was happening now. The arrival of Captain Kidd felt like a secret, something not intended for adult minds. Grown-ups couldn't handle it, wouldn't believe it anyway. Even I was starting to doubt the reality of our morning picnic. Might have been a group hallucination, brought on by exposure to pesticides or some such. Why hadn't the boy showed up again to prove to our friends we hadn't lost our marbles? Maybe something happened to him, the same way something happened to his patch fairy friend. After saying good night to Dad, I went upstairs, brushed my teeth, and climbed into bed. Not ready for sleep, I tried flipping through an issue of Beckett, but my effort to read was no good. In the dim glow of an Autobot's nightlight, my tired and distracted eyes refused to focus on the tiny columns of names and numbers. Anyway, the baseball cards I cared about I'd already looked up. I stashed the price guide under my bed and laid back on the pillow. The way I positioned myself, I could see the lake through the slots in the blinds. In a little while, my mom came to tuck me in and say our prayers. She didn't do that every night, but often enough I knew what to do when the time came. I said something about having a good day and for God to help me stay out of trouble, but made no mention of Captain Kidd, not in front of my mother. Afterward, she sat there with me, stroking my hair and humming softly. I resisted sleep. I always did that. But I could feel my eyelids giving up the fight. If I didn't say something fast, I'd fall asleep. So I asked, is Tommy sleeping? She brushed hair from my forehead. The weight of her hand, her fingers in my hair. It was like raking leaves of consciousness into a pile so she could bag them up and carry them away for the night. She leaned over and kissed me. Sweet dreams, she said, and got up to leave the room. As she closed the door behind her, my eyes were fixed on the moonlight reflections on the water. Then, slowly into the dancing white light of the moon, floated a familiar silhouette, the boy on his raft. Though he was easily a hundred yards away, and I was hidden in the darkness of my bedroom behind glass and the white slashes of the blinds, through all of that he saw me. He straightened to attention, brought a hand to his forehead, and whisked it away in casual salute. As you were, soldier. So it wasn't all in my head. He was real. Something new was happening. Something different. I could feel it in the coolest of the air swished about my bedroom by the ceiling fan, in the moonlight shining on the water outside, and in the droning cricket songs and bullfrog croaks. Something special was about to happen. It wasn't for grown-ups with their complicated lives, and it wasn't for children, but it was for people like me caught in the middle. Yes, because at about to be fourteen, 
I could believe in the simple, innocent magic of my bedtime prayers, and I wasn't bogged down in the quick, dry cement of grown-up reality. My friends and I were teens, but really, we were just kids, plain and simple. And that's exactly what was needed, as Captain Kidd drifted. His shadowed form faded into the surrounding darkness. I closed my eyes. The boy wasn't missing like the patch fairy, wasn't a figment of my overactive imagination either. He had seen me from his raft and waved. I felt important. Then an inspiration came to me. I felt under my pillow. My hand searched the covers. But no, there was no patch hiding there to reward me for my hopefulness. It seemed like there should be. At that moment, for the first time, I had a vague notion of what the captain must have felt like when the patches here never came. Another inspired impulse came to me then, or maybe this was what the first one was really all about. I bowled up a fist and breathed out a prayer, catching it between my fingers. I held it tight, else it might fly away, and slipping my hand beneath the pillow, I hid it there. Jacksonville might not have had a patch fairy, but we were not completely without magic. There was still a god to pray to at night, as my parents had so frequently instilled into me, always him overlooking everything, everywhere. He could find my prayer, my secret wish, even if the fairy could not. What had I, that restless and youthful version of myself, prayed for in that enchanting summer night? The Captain Kidd would find his fairy and I would help him do it. Chapter 3 Into the Lake We Go The next morning we found the boy's raft tied to a tree. Ozzy first spotted it, secured along the wooded side of the lake. There was no walkway on that side, and we rarely went that way, too thick with briars. Also, there were snakes, bad ones like copperheads and water moccasins. Occasionally a group of us would cast off such concerns in favor of adventure, but always someone returned with a blood-sucking tick hiding under their clothes. Ozzy asked, You think he's in the woods? I looked at him. Like camping? Maybe. Don grimaced. You think he's spent the night out there? The bugs would carry him away. He'd have spiders crawling in his hair and... She shivered. Ew! William grinned wickedly. Or a gator would grab him by the head and drag him under water. She swatted his arm. Shut up! That's mean! I'm going to check it out, William said. He looked at me. Want to come? I eyed Ozzy. We both shrugged. Why not? Don crossed her arms. I want to go. The three of us boys looked at her skeptically. She wasn't invited, obviously, because she was a girl and a pretty one at that. She might even get scratched, heaven forbid, or come upon a bugger tin. She'd already voiced that concern. Worse yet, possibly a snake could slither out of the briars. Excluding her would be a jerk move, I knew that, but also I knew sometimes boys needed to feel braver than girls. I came up with a compromise. Okay, but William leads the way. That satisfied everyone, although it wasn't like we could stop her from going any more than she could stop us. With eyes hidden behind the glossy black lenses of his sunglasses, William examined the raft in the water, the tree the craft was tied to, and the scraggly overgrown ground between. Then he proceeded. With his black hair combed back and in a plain white t-shirt and blue jeans, he looked like a kid from the 1950s, not a 90s hoser with an accountant for a father. He frequently dressed that way. Of our gang, he was the coolest by far and would have been the leader without question, but he was too shy for that. Ozzy followed him to the edge of the thicket. Ozzy was in a baggy pair of gym shorts and a grungy tank top. Also, that summer he was never without his shredded Oakland Athletics ball cap. Don looked at me, and I gestured for her to go ahead. Then into the thicket, the four of us marched, until we reached the raft which was moored to the trunk of a crepe myrtle full of pink blossoms. That's pretty, Don said. Oz reached up, shaking one of the branches, and the tiny pink petals rained down onto the dirt and into the water. William ducked beneath the tree, his sneakers grinding the fallen flower petals into the muck. When I saw the impression left by his shoes, I looked along the strip of sandy soil at the water line. 
there were the broad fork tracks of waddling ducks and some other sort of divots left by something smaller but no human tracks other than williams i pointed where's his tracks the others studied the ground a mystery a number of rational explanations could have explained what we were saying rather what we were not saying but don said he's hiding on it some place she was looking at the raft that made no sense a raft was a floating floor no walls or partitions of any kind as a boy had said it was made from logs and such strung together though as i examined the raft more closely even with it still well away from the bank i spotted bits and pieces of it that were less rudimentary pull it here i said william tugged the rope but the raft wouldn't budge must be anchored he suggested. I shaded my eyes. I could see no rope other than the one William held. So, why was it stuck? I tested the rope for myself. It gave up a few inches of slack and then nothing. The raft would not budge. Must be anchored, I agreed. Or stuck, Ozzie said, although I saw nothing in the water for it to be hung up on. Don shook off her flip-flops. I'm going in there. Then she dug in her back pocket for a hair tie. With her hair pulled back out of her face, she stepped boldly into the water. William Ozzy and I just watched. She went first into the shallow, but then deeper. In her blue jean cutoffs, the splashing water only wet her bare legs, not her clothes. When she reached the raft, she was standing in water halfway up her thighs. She turned to us and smiled, her hands lifting victoriously into the air. See? Easy! Then she tested the raft, pushing down on a corner. It wouldn't move for her either. Seems pretty solid to me, she said. I looked at my pants, then to William and Ozzie's legs. Ozzie was in shorts, shorts, yes, but much longer than Don's, and William was wearing blue jeans, same as me. I guess we're going in, I said. As William and I took off our shoes and socks, Ozzie kicked his Reeboks into the air and charged gracelessly into the water, splashing so much that not only were his shorts soaked, but also his shirt. He was so wet he might have dived in. It made us all laugh, including Don, who he drenched in the process, falling on her and groaning like a mummy in a Scooby-Doo cartoon. By the time William and I joined them in the water, they were already climbing aboard. As I climbed onto the raft, I saw how incredibly sturdy it was built. The logs fit so tightly together I couldn't see the water between the cracks. Also, all the middle logs were smoothly split, so the floor we stood upon was flat and without splinters. Don felt with her wet foot at the round of brackets set into the floor plank. It was polished brass, a heavy bit of hardware, one of the pieces I'd noticed not made from material harvested from the forest. The cell goes in there, I guessed. Hands on her hips, water dripping down her neck and black dirt speckling her arms, Don traced a large rectangle along the floor with her toe. Her toenails were painted purple, but the paint was flaking off. Look, she whispered. She was focusing our attention on a shape cut into the rough planks. Our youthful detective minds identified the purpose at once, a secret compartment. Then Don's words came back to me. He's hiding on it some place. As it turned out, she was right. Chapter 4 Door in the Floor In spite of the few refinements, the brass mounting bracket and a bundle of black squarehead nails, the raft was clearly not commercially made. It was, as the boy had claimed, made of logs, and the ones forming the perimeter were notched, fitted together, and secured with ropes. The raft sat low in the water, mere inches above the surface. With the four of us on it, it should have rocked and swayed terribly, but it didn't. It felt as securely fixed as any pier I'd walked on. A part of me wondered if it was the same raft we'd seen before. For that matter, was it a raft at all? Maybe it was something different. Whatever it was, it was small. If I had laid down, I likely could have touched all four sides at once with some part of my body. I took a knee and felt at the rectangle on the floor. Perhaps if I had a knife, like the one the boy kept and wore in his belt, I could have used it to pry the thing open, if it opened at all. 
but I had no knife and my fingernails weren't strong enough. Ozzy leaned over me. What's this? He pushed a circular knot in the wood. It sank into the plank, popping up again with a click as he released it. The knot was some kind of handle. We all looked at each other, my friends' faces mixing with varied levels of trepidation and curiosity all urged me forward to go ahead and open the secret door. I looked down at the raised wooden knot. The vertical surface had a smooth groove carved around it for gripping. I touched it cautiously. What if it was a trap? Slowly, I pulled the knot and the door tilted open on hidden hinges. It creaked, and my arms stiffened, but I kept going. As the door eased open, the sunlight streaming in did not reveal a simple compartment for stowing trinkets, but an entire lower cabin, and a large one at that. Captain Kidd reclined below us in a hammock strung neatly between a pair of bookcases. He squinted against the inrushing sunlight. Shading his eyes with a hand, he leaned over and trimmed out the flame on a red lantern hanging from a hook on the wall. The walls of the cabin were logs, like a log cabin out in the woods. It was impossible to think that such a large room, especially a wooden one, existed beneath the water line below the tiny raft floor. I looked from the open door, past the edge of the raft, and saw nothing below us in the water but murky brown vegetation and blue-green tinted sand. No cabin at all, unless it was invisible from the outside. William was leaning over the edge of the raft. I could tell by the expression on his face that he saw nothing beneath us either. It's cloaked, he said, like a Klingon bird of prey. He was referring to the enemy warships on Star Trek, and of course he was exactly right. Then I heard Don's breath catch in her chest. When I looked up, both she and Ozzy were frozen in place. Don's hand stiffly reached for my arm, and she stepped back. I had to catch her from falling backwards into the water. William went for the hole in the floor, lifting his glasses onto his forehead. When he looked into the shadowy space, his eyes widened, his face hardening. That was his fighting face. I glanced at Don. She was clinging to me. Then, as boldly as I dared, I looked into the impossible space beneath us. At first, I saw only what I noticed before. The boy in his hammock, the bookshelves, the red lantern on the wall. But as my eyes adjusted to the dimness, I could see farther into the dark corners. There in the shadows, sitting in a rocking chair, was a man. A broad-brimmed cowboy hat hit his face, but I could faintly make out the rough silver of his beard. He wore a black duster, dirty, scuffed, and ruffled from long use. The hard triangular tips of his boots clipped the line of sunlight at his feet like black mountain peaks. Most importantly, however, was a shape of a rifle propped across his lap. Even with the gentle morning breeze blowing across the lake, I could smell the oiled steel. The man was the most menacing creature I had ever laid eyes on, as hard as a boxer's fist and twice as mean. I knew at once there sat the reason the kid's patch fairy stopped delivering merit badges. She'd fallen victim to that monster. He'd killed her or was holding her ransom, and now he had Captain Kidd, us too, if we weren't careful. My eyes shot to William. He slipped a foot under the upturned lip of the open door. With the slightest nod from me, he'd kick it shut, and the four of us could spring into the water before the villain lifted his gun, much less fired a shot. My heart raced. Then I felt Don's arm brush against me. Her hands were balled into fists. She looked ready to, not just to fight, but to murder the no-good outlaw where he sat. What would she do? Pounce down on him like a lunatic badger, wild-eyed and nails thrashing? I had no idea, but seeing her like that gave me strength. I looked down on Captain Kidd again. The relaxation I'd observed on his face was a mistake. He was lying in a hammock, true, but his eyes were weary and blinking, his jaw muscles tense, his whole body as tight as a bowstring. He looked scared, tired, and angry in equal portions. I didn't know the young captain well, but I doubted he was often so out of sorts. With a thick voice, I asked him, "'You okay?' "'I've had some bad news,' he said. "'Bad news? Was that what he called strange gunmen?' I looked to the shadowy figure, and out of the corner of my eye I could see William's leg muscles flex ready to fling the door shut. 
But Captain Kidd did something strange. He waved for us to climb down, as if the big bad wolf wasn't waiting there to devour us. The captain followed my eyes. I'm okay, he said. Marshal Rabin's a friend. When the cowboy tipped back his head, the face I saw was not a monstrous wolf's grinning gray muzzle, but looked instead like the world's toughest grandpa. He looked like a man who'd spent twenty years in the Marine Corps and then enjoyed his retirement on beat cop duty in a crime-ridden inner city, only instead of the crisp blue uniform of a police officer, he dressed instead like a bounty hunter in a western movie. Marshal? I asked. Is that your name, or— the man folded back his duster. On his shirt, a tarnished metal star. He spoke with a voice as dry as the dust on his clothes. U.S. Marshal Service. At that, a breath rushed out of me as relief poured in. I felt like I'd been the opposite of snake bit, like poison was being sucked out of me rather than squirted in. Ozzie teetered and swayed. Oh, man, you guys were freaking me out. In an exaggerated motion, he wiped his forehead with the back of his hand. Then, bending down to take a better look at the basement dwellers, he propped his hands on the soaked legs of his shorts. You guys are really something, you know that? The cowboy looked at Captain Kidd. These are the ones you told me about? I told you they would find us. The captain scrutinized their faces. Except, who are you? He was talking to William. He's with me, I said. He's my best friend. The cowboy smiled. Let him speak for himself, son. His rust-colored eyes focused on William. Well, young man, the good captain asked you a question. I'd hear you answer. William pushed his sunglasses a little farther onto his forehead. His young face mirrored more of the man's hard menace than I thought possible. I wasn't home yesterday morning, he looked at the captain, when you were here before. Then he raked fingers through his hair, sighing, and hung his thumbs in the front pockets of his jeans. My name's William Gazick. He shot a quick nod over his shoulder. I live down the street. What is this place? Some kind of magic trick? Something like that, the young captain said. Uh-huh. William's mutter was a sound of skepticism, and I wholeheartedly agreed. The magic seemed true, but the trick did not. Something like that, the kid had said. The captain and his marshal did not feel like prankster magicians. These were no pen and teller, not at all. But the clear, empty water beneath us had to be an illusion, using mirrors or I didn't know what, but not real magic. Surely not. That would be crazy. We can come inside? Don asked. The captain nodded. I hope you will, but leave the door open. It's stuffy in here. Oz was the first down the ladder. He seemed eager to go. I followed him, only a little reluctant, because, well, I had prayed for something like this. Prayed to help the captain. Now this was happening. Don came down after me. The room was huge for a raft, which had no business having a lower cabin at all. But with the five of us inside, it felt crowded. My back was to a wall lined with fishing rods and tackle. Don standing close at my left. To my right, William was coming down the ladder. Captain Kidd sat up in his hammock, crossing his legs. He stretched out a hand toward William. I'm Captain Kidd. Welcome. They shook hands. I looked to Ozzy, who was standing between a dresser and the marshal, eyeing the long gun laid across the cowboy's lap. Down in the small room, the smell of the gun was stronger, and now I could also smell his dusty leathers. An armoire and desk occupied the space between Marshal Rabin and Don. Atop the dresser, an aquarium glowed blue, casting ghostly shimmers onto the wall. The bottom of the tank was lined with river rocks, across which scooted the reddest crab I'd ever seen. After taking in the scene, I asked, Are you going to tell us what this is about? Then Don, You said there was bad news? The little captain nodded heavily. Remember I told you the patch fairy's missing? Turns out she's been kidnapped. His eyes flicked to the marshal, then back to Dawn. I intend to rescue her. You do? Her whisper brimmed with admiration. The captain looked my direction, and whatever he hoped to glimpse in my eyes, he probably didn't see it. 
To me, the crime didn't seem real, not even close. For that matter, the fairy herself was still an open question. At that moment, I was more interested in trying to figure out how the cabin fit under the raft. He smiled at me warmly. What do you think of my boat? More like a submarine, I guess. He leaned back in the hammock and tapped the log wall behind him with a knuckle. Neat trick, right? Was it a trick? How is this possible? Don asked, her eyes dancing between wonderment and fear. The cowboy answered, It's not possible, young miss, not normally, but the good captain ain't from around here. He squinted, peering over at the kid. They don't know about the decks, do they? Not yet, the captain said. The marshal felt in his pocket. Are you going to explain it, or should I? Chapter 5 The Reality Decks Captain Kidd got to his feet. After gathering up the hammock into his arms, he deposited the bundle into a basket on the floor. Then he donned a white captain's cap, twisted a wooden peg on the wall, and folded a long tray table down between the shelves where his bed had been. He looked to William. Hand me that chair, would you? William found a metal folding chair tucked behind the ladder. He handed it over, and the cowboy marshal offered the captain two packs of playing cards from a coat pocket. When Captain Kidd was seated at the table, he slid the cards from their boxes and lined the decks neatly side by side. He turned, looking each of us in the eye. His mood had changed, not as weary as before, not as angry either, but he was still very serious, whatever he was going to show us he only wanted to do at once. He turned again to the table, his youthful hand settling over the cards, one stack blue, the other red. His thumbs fanned through the deck, seeming as familiar with playing cards as my dad, who was my family's all-time shuffler. As the captain's thumbs lifted the neighboring corners of the decks, the opposing pressure of his hands drove the cards down again in rapid patter against the tabletop. Gradually, he moved the corners of the decks together, the red and blue cards just barely missing, then brushing together as he fanned them, and finally falling with overlapping edges. With the corners of the cards interlaced, he adjusted his grip, then delicately moved the stacks together, so no more than their white borders touched. He lowered his head to examine the gently steepled stacks. Satisfied, his mood brightened a bit more. Reality, he began, is like two decks of cards shuffled together. They meet ever so slightly in the middle. There's a red side and a blue side, and they have layers. His voice had the rare quality of a teacher who marvels over a favorite subject. See there, the little gaps between the cards? Where the decks met, cards from one stack made spaces in the other. Reality is like that, gaps between the layers, but they touch. Captain Kidd was in his element, the way his voice smoothed into a calm, concentrated whisper and his expression softened. It seemed as if talking about the cards was therapeutic to him. His fingers moved over the decks with such care. We're right about mm, here, I'd say. Squeezing the pad of his finger down with his thumb, he was able to point with just his fingernail. Our eyes were directed to a card very near the top of the blue deck. He met my eyes. Understand? he asked. I nodded. He looked at me long enough to make me uncomfortable, but when he was satisfied, his eyes moved on to my friends. They also nodded. The captain looked at the cards again. It's possible to move between the layers, but you have to be in the middle where the cards meet. Another thing to consider, reality has its own kind of physics. Easier to go down a deck than up. That's called reality gravity. Once more, his eyes checked to make sure we were keeping up. We were. Don looked around the cabin. Is this room in our world, or yours, or somewhere else? I don't understand how a door in a little raft opens up to this place. Are we on another card? Like another layer of reality? Not really, the kid said. The marshal's gruff, rumbling voice offered a more complete answer. This is magic. Like the captain said, it's a trick. If reality is divvied up into thin slices like a deck of cards, this room is in the empty space between the layers. We all looked at him. This place is unusual magic. 
Marsha Rabin said this with a measure of reverence. Don's attention returned to Captain Kidd's folding table. She was looking at the two decks, one side red, the other blue. Where do you think the patch fairy is? The captain's lips pulled to one side. Mm, maybe one level up? William locked his arms across his chest. What happened to her? How do you know she's kidnapped? The captain eyed the adult in the room. Marshal Rabin propped his rifle against the wall and leaned forward with his elbows on his knees. I'd heard talk the kids were getting their patches, but thought nothing of it till someone found the fairy's cart abandoned. It was left outside one of those Victorian houses in old New Orleans. When I got there, I knew something was wrong, because her wagon was already turning to dust. A smile took the corner of Don's mouth. Fairy dust? she asked. Sounds funny to you, I guess. The marshal took a labored breath. What I found there... "'Twere nothing funny about that.' "'He leaned back in the rocking chair, "'the soles of his boots scuffing against the dry planks, "'his coat open, revealing the worn grips of revolvers, "'one at each hip. "'I wondered what other sorts of armaments he was carrying, "'maybe a sawed-off shotgun or dynamite. "'Even though he was a marshal, presumably a good guy, "'intimidation rolled off him like smoke from a burning tire. As he spoke, I could hear the wiry whiskers along his lower jaw scratching the raised collar of his duster. The neighbors said the house was rented to a little girl, no parents, and the day before the cart arrived, the girl invited them over for a recital. Apparently, she learned to play something special on the piano, something by Friedrich Chopin. It was very pretty, they said. After listening to the cowboy's thunderstorm voice, Ozzy sounded like a squeaky five-year-old. That's why the patch fairy came? To give her a patch for learning a song? The marshal sniffed. That's what I suspect. And the girl? Don asked. I'm getting to that. The marshal rocked in the chair, the heels of his boots pushing against the floor in creaking rhythm, no doubt timed perfectly to the second hand of his pocket watch. It made me feel dizzy, he growled. I knocked on the door, but no one answered, so I picked the lock and went inside. The house was dark. I flipped the switch, but nothing. Either the breaker was tripped or she hadn't paid her bill. Up until this point, I had pictured the story taking place in another world before electricity. He'd said New Orleans, but I didn't think he was talking about our version of the city. No one in our world rented houses to kids without parents. At least, I didn't think so. His rusty eyes flickered darkly. In one of the bedrooms, the one that Luke lived in, the bed was all a shambles. Beneath the pillow I found a looped cable. It ran down the bed to a heavy spring and a foot pedal. To the left of me, Don's hand rose to her mouth. William gave voice to her fears. It was a trap, for when the fairy gave her a patch, the dusty cowboy stroked his mustache. Yeah. I got the feeling that he was leaving something out, like the blood he'd found on the cable. Then it was the captain's turn to speak. The Patch Fairy's more than just a fairy. She's a daughter of the King of the Blue Realms. She's a princess, Don said. Yes, Captain Kidd said as tall as he was able. I have to find her, to free her if I can, William asked. Can we help? Captain Kidd smiled. You're brave. I was hoping you would ask that. I shook my head. No offense, but we're just kids. We can't save a princess. I gestured to the gunslinger in the rocking chair. He, with his hard features and years of experience, not to mention all of his weapons. Take him. He can do it easily. Captain Kidd and the marshal exchanged looks. The marshal said, I would, maybe, but I can't. Outside of my jurisdiction, I'm a U.S. Marshal, and up there, he motioned with his thumb, that ain't America. No version of it. I don't go there. The captain looked to me. It's not for grown-ups anyway. Why not? I asked. Just isn't? Captain Kidd gestured to the Marshal. He'll go left into the red deck. We'll go up. Why not down? Ozzy asked. You said down is easier. I came from down. So did Marshal Rabin. I asked, what if she went up again, and again, all the way to the top? No, the captain said with confidence, not that far. Trust me, one level's high enough. He adjusted his hat. But you should know, monsters live in the attic of the world. 
Great things, too, but even they are dangerous. The great things didn't concern me, but monsters? What kind of monsters? I asked. The marshal answered, Spiders with faces, dead kings of darkness, the terrible black unicorn nightmare with all of his minions. He dusted off his pants. I should be off. He stood, towering over us. I'll leave you the rifle. If I happen upon a trail, I'll send the hawk. You know where to find the upward-facing door. It's close, the captain said. But my compass is going nuts. He took a brass compass from his pocket and handed it to Marshal Rabin. The marshal examined it. Beneath the glass, a little red needle was bouncing, first one direction, then another. When he shook it, the needle spun circles. Where's the button to select the door you want? Captain Kidd grinned like a boy caught doing something funny but wrong. It broke off. The marshal raised an eyebrow, handing it back. You should get that fixed. I will. It levels off when I'm closer to the mark. The grizzly cowboy scratched beneath his chin, eyeing me and my compatriots. Then to the captain he said, You sure about these little ones? They're awful green. They'll do, the captain assured him. Marshal Rabin propped his hands on his pistol grips. I reckon I could show you to the shuttle. It's a booger to find with no guide and a busted compass. When do you plan on setting off? Right now, the captain said. I scoffed. Now what will we tell our parents? I hope you won't tell him anything. Captain Kidd shouldered a backpack that looked like something a soldier would carry into war, except no ordinary soldier and no ordinary war, either. It was army green canvas bulging with pockets, but the shoulder straps were leather decorated with beads and dangling shark teeth. We can't just leave, I said. When will we get back? Then Don asked, What about Layla? She'll want to come. Captain Kidd shrugged. Layla isn't here. Sorry, I called, but she didn't answer. What's that supposed to mean? Don was close to tears. I can't explain it, he said. You found me, she didn't. It's not her fault, she's probably too young. The marshal stepped between Don and I. Trust the captain. No one knows the decks better than him. With that, the old cowboy climbed the ladder, disappearing with a flourish of his coat of the open hatch. We followed, although, if we knew what we were getting into... Layla wouldn't have been the only one to stay home. Chapter 6 The Way We were allotted thirty minutes to gather our things, which was the right amount of time, not enough to think of everything we needed, but that meant we would travel light. Also, thirty minutes meant we were too busy packing our book bags to think of how incredibly reckless we were being. After all, we were gearing up to follow a strange kid with a magical raft and a grizzly cowboy with revolvers on his hips, follow them into the forest, no less. That sort of irresponsibility could end with our pictures on the sides of milk cartons. What's more, apparently we were leaving the magic raft behind. When my bag was packed, I took a moment to peek into my brother's room. Tommy was squatting by his bed, arranging stormtroopers into battle positions amidst his sheets. From around his pillow, the stormtroopers' movements were being watched by a small contingent of rebel soldiers, chief among them Luke Skywalker in his hoth snowsuit. The Jedi had a lightsaber in one molded plastic hand and a blaster in the other. Tommy, I said, want to go on an adventure? Oh, how I wanted him to say yes, but he scarcely even looked up. Nah, he muttered, and went right back to playing. Although he was years older than Don's little sister Layla, he was still only eleven. Maybe that was too young to hear the captain calling. My shoulders slumped. See you later. Then closing the door behind me, I left him to his own alternate version of reality. I'd have expected the marshal to lead us into the forest from atop a horse. That's not how it happened, though. He walked with us, the heavy heels of his boots coming down on the pavers like clomping hoes. The old cowboy's holstered pistols brushed against his marching legs. Captain Kidd walked beside him, the cowboy's long rifle slung over one shoulder and carrying his wartime satchel on his back. Why no one stopped us or called the police must have been more magic. Ozzy was darting ahead, running and stopping. He wore a Jose Canseco jersey and had an aluminum baseball bat. He'd swing the bat, spin around, and take off running, all the while spouting make-believe play-by-play commentary. 
We um sometimes ran ahead with him, wrestling Ozzy for the bat so we could have a go. Lucky no one got knocked in the head. Don walked with me. We trailed the young captain and the cowboy marshal. Don had changed out of her cutoffs and into long pants. Her backpack was red, like her father's corvette, and her hair was nearly the same color as the car's tan interior. And then there was me, feeling the weight of the backpack on my shoulders, something I hadn't felt since school ended. There was a different kind of way, too, because I knew what we were doing was dangerous. Yet... We were invincible, barely teenagers with our whole lives ahead. What could happen to us? And truly, we were caught up in the moment. Dawn nudged me playfully with her elbow. Think they're really from other worlds? I don't know. She nudged me again this time in the ribs and a lot harder. Ow! I pushed her away. She laughed. Come on, you big baby. Are they from other worlds or not? I shrugged. How am I supposed to know? Then we were walking so close, our arms brushed together. She spoke gently. Just guess. What do you think? She looked me in the eyes. I think... Like, they almost have to be. I think so, too. She smiled brightly. This is fun, right? Sure, I said. But to me, it did not feel fun at all. It felt right, like it was the right thing for us to do. But that was well short of feeling fun. I looked to the marching figures ahead of us to the boy and man who'd set us on this journey. Did they have any idea of the strangeness of what we were doing? If so, they didn't show it. For that matter, neither did William or Ozzie. Don was the only one showing any anxiety at all. She conspired in a hushed voice. They might be crazy. Might be, but I don't know, I said again, and looked back along the lake in the direction of our houses disappearing into the distance. The raft was pretty amazing, like magic, I admitted. Rare magic, she said. And what about the monsters? She took my hand in hers. That felt, well, it helped me think of the adventure as a good idea, I can say that much. But then she let go of my hand to grip the straps of her book bag. Come on, she said, and then we were running to catch up to the others. Where the walkway divided, Marshal Rabin took the lead, guiding us away from the pool complex and basketball courts and toward the forest. After a short distance, near the thick growth of trees, the paving stone walkway ended at a raised boardwalk. I had walked upon those weather-treated boards with my father several times, but even then the pathway had an eerie feel. Old trees shaded the curving path with canopies sagging with moss. Spiders, big ones like silver and yellow orb weavers, spun webs high up in the trees, high enough to walk under, but sometimes lower down around face level where boys could walk into them if they weren't careful. The cowboy, however, did not intend to use the established trail. Captain Kidd took out his compass. Still, the needle bounced. Which way? he asked. The marshal stepped left into the grass and fallen leaves. Past him, at the edge of the forest, was a tall, broad gate of rough-cut timbers. The crossbeam above the gate was decorated with a long-horned bull skull. How we had managed to pass this way so many times without noticing such an obvious landmark, none of us could say. But here it stood, looking decades older than the neighborhood itself. The marshal took out a revolver, spinning the cylinder to check the bullets, then holstered it again. He spoke to us, his voice dry and grumbly, like a thirsty bear. Ever been in these woods, kids? We all nodded. Good, he said. Then you know how thick it is. He opened the gate. Step high and keep moving. When I say so, we'll stop and check for ticks. Mister, I said. I paused, giving myself time to form my feelings into words. I looked to my friends, each of them looking to me. I was not the leader of this rescue party, that was Captain Kidd or maybe the Marshal, but I was still leading my friends. I would lead them back home if necessary. What's up? William asked. You don't want to go? I looked from William to Don, to Ozzy, then to Captain Kidd in his vest full of patches, and last up at the Marshal. 
Marshal Rabin's face was like leather, his beard silver wires, his eyes beads of rusty glass. He was well over six feet tall and strong, even though he was old. Walking into a forest full of ticks, spiders, and snakes to find a kidnapper was just his thing, what he was built for. But I was in a t-shirt, not a duster, sneakers, not cowboy boots, and I had a folding knife in my pocket, but no guns. Where are you taking us? I asked. The marshal rolled his bottom lip. I told you, son, to the shuttle. What's that? I still didn't know. It's how you get to the level above this one, the next card up in the deck. He smiled a little, amused in a way that scared me. He eyed Captain Kidd, then looked at me again. I didn't know what to say, but I knew I wasn't about to follow this creepy stranger into the woods without more information. Why? I asked, realizing that each of my questions was shorter than the last. Why what? He rasped. Then speaking quickly, I said, Why up? Why not some other way? Then Ozzy, God bless him, added, How do you know the Patch Fairy is around here someplace? "'Because I followed her trail,' the marshal growled. "'Not hers. You can't track a fairy, but I tracked the girl who stole her.' "'Finally, we were getting somewhere. Why can't you track a fairy?' I asked. "'Charles,' the cowboy studied me. "'That's your name, right?' I nodded. "'Charles, if a fairy is unconscious, you could fold her up small enough to fit in a matchbook. Just keep folding her.' He said that like it was obvious. Can't track that, but I can track the girl who's carrying her. I followed her here and sent my hawk to get the captain. Captain Kidd said, That's why I first came to your world. Then the cowboy, I got here first and looked for her. You might have seen her yourself, a girl about your age with black hair streaked blue. She has blue eyes and pale skin. He paused. You seen a girl like that? Don spoke quietly. I did when I was walking Pepsi. That was her dog's name. The marshal nodded. Aye, and did you speak to her? Don shook her head vehemently. Why not? he asked. Don's hands balled up at her stomach. She felt wrong, gave me the chills, and Pepsi started barking at her. He never does that. Marshal Raven looked to the rest of us. Any of you see her? We hadn't. He hooked his thumbs in his gun belts. She wouldn't stay here. Too much unwanted attention. I reckon she's on her way up the deck. But how do you know that? I asked. More than asked, I pleaded. Even here people go missing all the time. It was true. The show Unsolved Mysteries was all about missing people. The cowboy sniffed the air, his nostrils expanding over the silvery tusks of his mustache. There's no scent of her in the air. She smells like candy and smoke. At that, Don recoiled. Apparently, she'd smelled her as well. The marshal adjusted his hat. The brim was wet with sweat. It's all right, little miss. She ain't around here any more. That's what I'm telling you. She left. I'm sure of it. She went up, Don whispered. Captain Kidd spoke. Or into the red deck, but probably up. And we're going to chase her, I said. The captain nodded, the faintest smile upon his lips. That's right, Charles. Chase her, and catch her, and rescue the Patch Fairy. He nodded toward the forest. But to do that, we need the shuttle. And it would help if the marshal could lead us to it, wouldn't you agree? I did, of course, and the lightness of his tone made me feel better. But still, I was not ready to commit myself and my closest friends to the hunt. My final question came to me then. Do you know the girl who stole the ferry? Captain Kidd's eyes looked to the bouncing compass needle. I think I must, he said, his voice showing no sign of heaviness. But walking helps me think, and her name is difficult to remember. Will you let me think about it on the way? How could I argue? Looking to the agreeable expressions on my friends' faces, I relented, and into the forest we went, following in the marshal's broad footprints. Chapter 7 A Ring of Stone We followed Marsha Rabin and the young captain into the undergrowth, shoving ourselves into the thick of it. Every bush we touched had thorns, and a different month it would have been a great place to pick blackberries, but now all the berries were past ripe, their leaves turning from green to ash gray. Every which way, vines tangled around trees. It was rough going because, like the bushes, the vines also wore thorns. 
eventually the hard ground and thicket gave way to muck and tall grass that made movement easier but then i became convinced that one or all of us would wind up snake bit or gator chomped when we came to a stream captain kidd took off his scuffed loafers and hopped across barefoot balancing on the large rocks just below the surface of the water the marshal went next how he managed not to slip in his smooth-soled boots i had no idea because the rocks were slime-covered and slippery as eels once we were all across william walked with me for a while feels like we're in a movie he said i bet we get gold medals if we save the patch fairy or at least a wicked patch to sew on her jackets i don't see me wearing a vest i eyed him doubtfully if she's actually real could be totally bogus you know to the max william swatted a mosquito maybe not though considering the otherworldly cowboy trudging ahead of us i reassessed the situation might find out it's all real including the monsters might william grinned but the marshal's got guns bang 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 he blew invisible smoke from the barrels of his fingers i groaned he's not going with us remember he's got his own deck to check out oh yeah the red one william shot a glance at don then leaned toward me think it's smart to bring your girlfriend i rolled my eyes she's not my girlfriend dummy whatever you're practically going steady shut up barfbag you're just jealous that girls know the truth that i'm awesome and you're a walking butt wipe william roared ha ha good one psych i make you look like a soup sandwich with a fart stain on the bread he smoothed back his hair then looking to me his expression became an exaggerated frowny face she just feels sorry for you cause when you was a baby in diapers mama dropped you on your soft little head i couldn't help but laugh then mere inches ahead of the marshal a turkey burst into flight the cowboy yanked out a gun and fired before i had time to form a single cohesive thought he was stretched forward his right hand reaching out the gun barrel extending away from his hand like a wizard's wand his movements had come so incredibly fast his reaction speed like that of a mouse trap i'd never seen a man move so quickly and yet he'd missed the cowboy grumbled that could have been my dinner then muttering to himself he slipped the revolver back into the smooth pocket of his holster only then did i realize captain kidd had also acted upon the unexpected rousing he had the marshal's rifle unslung and lifted to his shoulder but then he raised the gun point into the air and fired that thing was fast he said the marshal eyed the captain's vest pocket what's your compass say now captain kidd took out the instrument flipping open the brass lid with his thumb we gathered around to see the needle bob slowly between two points marshal raymond lifted off his hat another quarter mile i guess everybody check for ticks do it quick we'll check again when we get to the shuttle i found one sneaking up my pants and another on my belly so gross i always hated ticks with a passion but fortunately no one else found any we came to a place in the forest where a huge wall blocked our way the blockade stood perhaps nine feet high and spread out to the left and right a badly weathered wall of dead gray and living green the colors of concrete reclaimed by nature what was the purpose of this barrier i had no idea how far did it go again unknown through the dense growth of trees i could see no corners for all i knew it walled off the entire forest and a more important question what was on the other side a secret government base was one option presented by my imagination then i remembered the berlin wall which had so recently been torn down i could still hear president reagan's booming voice mr gorbachev tear down this wall that was big news the berlin wall went up through the middle of the german capital after world war ii one side capitalist the other side communist so many sad stories came of that i stared up at the barrier this side capitalist did that mean the other side was communist surely not nothing like that was in america the structure was dreary-looking and old but from my limited viewpoint i saw no lookout towers or gunmen walking the perimeter that is with the exception of marshal raven and the captain i looked to the left 
the wall unless i was mistaken had a slight curve to it i checked right yes the wall was curved william pressed his hand to the concrete i did the same the wall was cool to the touch and rough against my palm the cowboy stood over me i'll lift you up his fingers laced together in front of him the implication clear i eyed william then the marshal what's on the other side i asked climb up and you'll see he lowered his linked hands william shook his head he wasn't telling me not to do it but was expressing some of my own frustration in the constant lack of useful information why couldn't the man just tell us what we wanted to know the cowboy's face was a leathery grinning contemptuous mask his eyes dark beads in the shadows cast by his hat if he thought this was funny maybe he was the villain after all Captain Kidd's curious look was only slightly less irritating than the marshal's. To him, this whole operation seemed to be some kind of amusing test, only we couldn't know the rules because it was more entertaining to keep us in the dark. Why did I offer to help this guy again? I was trying to remember. Seeing no better course of action, and because everyone was waiting for me, I took off my backpack and lifted my foot into the cowboy's mighty grip. Then I braced my hands on his shoulders. As he hoisted me into the air, I reached to grasp the upper lip of the wall. My fingers clung to the edge, the rough concrete biting into my skin while patches of slick wet mildew threatened to spill me onto Marshal Rabin's head. I didn't slip, though, and with reasonable confidence I swung up a leg. I was good at that sort of work. When I stood, I saw I'd smeared my pants and shirt with blackish-green moldy streaks. Oh, man! i pawed uselessly at my clothes but as i turned around i forgot about the mess i'd made of myself whatever i had expected before it was not the scene set before me i was looking at a huge circular pond of murky water it was not a lake but some kind of man-made pool also i instantly realized how massive the concrete structure was the wall i stood upon was easily eight feet thick and stretched away from me in an even flat arc forming a perfect circle of incredible size probably the width of a football stadium and yes the inside of the circle was filled completely with water nearly up to the top my best guess totally unsupported by evidence was this strange construction was some sort of water treatment facility what that meant in practical terms i hadn't the foggiest idea only the place was unreasonably big and it looked long abandoned well chuckles what the heck is it ozzy stared up at me with twisted befuddlement on his impatient face i'm not sure what it is it was the honest truth the marshal growled at me what do you see the world's biggest dirtiest swimming pool i said i could tell by the slump of his broad shoulders that he wasn't pleased captain kidd went to him it's filled with water too much rain i guess nah marshal raven took off his hat and scratched his forehead drain must be clogged i'll see if i can find the pump he shot irritated glances at each of his companions check yourself for ticks again a holler when i find something then the marshal stomped off following along the base of the wall in search of the pump i looked back over the water strange to see such a massive body of liquid forming a perfect unbroken circle if this thing's deep at all it'll take forever to drain i want to see william took ozzy by the shoulder help me up my friends took turns boasting one another and tossing up the book bags. Captain Kidd came up last. Lying on our bellies, William and I caught the captain's hands when he jumped. Then we hoisted him to the top. With the exception of Captain Kidd, everyone seemed as impressed and perplexed as I was by the massive circular swamp. When Dawn looked into the inky water, she asked, How deep is this thing? she asked no one in particular but we all guessed all but the captain who had absolutely nothing to say after a few minutes of speculation we began to walk along the top of the wall in the direction of marshal rabin birds chirped in the trees and insects made their clicking communications the water in the pond gave off a stagnant musk and the air was miserably humid sweat dripped down my back and the sun cooked my neck but we were moving and our interest was up so it wasn't boring in the least several minutes passed quietly but then we heard the marshal call over here we jogged toward his voice and when we found him he was standing beside an old metal building 
from the building spouted two metal pipes, each broad enough for a skinny person to crawl into. They stretched away from the side of the outbuilding and disappeared into the base of the wall we were standing on. Unlike the place where we climbed up, here there was a ladder bolted to the concrete. Opposite that, on the inside of the ring, a rickety, badly rusted stairway dipped down into the water. As we watched from above, Marshal Rabin rolled back a door on the side of the shed. Then I understood the shed was not really a building at all, but everything below the corrugated roof was part of a machine. It was actually a gigantic pump-house. The marshal lifted a panel and turned a key. E vroom, 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 and the pump sputtered out. He adjusted the choke and tried again several times, but it wouldn't start. All the while, he muttered curses to himself. Check the gas, Captain Kidd suggested. The marshal wiped a panel of gauges with his thumb. Shows full. It's probably a weak battery, the captain surmised. The marshal leaned on the machine with his hands, his head hanging down, the toe of his boot kicking at the dirt. Your machines will be the death of you, you know that. The captain snapped his fingers. It's probably got a pull start in case of emergency. Marshal Rabin straightened, then sticking his hand into a dark gap in the machinery, he felt around, bringing out a pull cord. With hands propped dramatically on his hips, the captain offered, Do I need to come down there? If he meant it as a taunt, I'm not sure, but that's what it sounded like to me. The cowboy tugged the cord, a mighty pull to be sure. The motor turned and sputtered. He tried again and pop! The cord snapped off, sending him sprawling to the ground. He jerked up, roared a series of obscenities, and kicked the frame of the machine. The pump house shuddered. For a second, I thought he was going to shoot it full of holes. I half wanted him to. But instead, he settled for tossing the broken handle at Captain Kidd, who was laughing at him. Funny, sure, the cowboy yelled. You start it then. The captain went to the ladder, bolted to the concrete circle, and lowering his legs over the side, he slid down. After a brief exchange with the cowboy, it was decided that starting water pumps was work perfectly suited for four strong boys and one equally matched young lass. So Marshal Rabin wished us luck and shook our hands. Then he left through the woods to find his own secret door, a door which he said had to be opened at dusk. We watched him go. I did not like the man, not at all. But with the only adult gone, the forest felt darker, our predicament more serious, and our position seemed deeper in the wilderness than it had a moment before. The young captain appeared unaffected by the marshal's departure. Whistling to himself, he took off his backpack and from a zipper pocket produced a bundle of rope. He unspooled it, tying one end to the broken pole cord. We joined him, looped the rope in our hands, and yanked at his command. After a dozen tries, the machine came alive. The engine made a chugging sound. The pipes gurgled, then whooshed. We could hear the flow of liquid that saw the lowland pulling with water that was dark with the decay of fallen leaves. Chapter 8 The Shuttle From atop the wall... We watched the water level recede in the stadium-sized circle of concrete. At first, a shiver went out across the surface. Then, ever so slowly, the water began to rotate. This we could only tell by the motions of leaves floating along the edges. Still, there was no way to know its depth. The water was too black. When the water level sunk near the level of the forest ground, I expected to see a floor appear through the thinning murk, but I did not. Instead, what I saw was a single little white bump emerge from the middle of the receding pool. The bump was not much bigger than the backs of the turtles peeking up out of the water. Soon this bump was revealed to be the tip of a metal post. Still, there was no bottom to be seen, not yet. The water continued to drain past the ground level, and when it was thirty-five or forty feet below us, we saw the post, or presumably it was an antenna, was affixed to a heavy framework of steel beams. Even then I had no idea what we were looking at. Over the next hour, the retreating water revealed more buried secrets. In the center of the gigantic concrete pit, 
the metal framework stood out from the surrounding water like some sort of tower almost like an offshore oil derrick and beside it was what looked to be an orange pointy-topped silo almost like a grain silo to each side of the silo white cones appeared in the water after that between the cones fixed to the side of the larger orange structure a black dome emerged that was when i started to understand what i was looking at not a grain silo nor any kind of silo the orange cylinder was a fuel tank the smaller white rocket-shaped cylinders were just that rockets the cowboy had taken us to a shuttle indeed not like a bus the black dome was the nose cone of a space shuttle and the metal framework beside it was its launch tower we were looking down on it far down then i realized how deep the hole must be already a sense of vertigo seized me when i came too close to the plunging concrete cliff where this shuttle had come from who could say i was certain all the shuttles were accounted for and no space shuttle ever launched from my neighborhood i was certain of that a shuttle launch could be seen from hundreds of miles away so if one took off within walking distance of my house even i couldn't miss that we watched the water withdrawal and the sunken spaceship was revealed in the bleak depths water poured off of it dead leaves speckled its white surface and the wings were strung with snake-like vines all the windows were caked with slime and the whole thing had a mildly haunted look only a fool would think it still capable of flight turtles slipped down off the launch pad deck splashing into the water i followed one with my eyes its bobbing head disappearing into a large pipe set into the wall it was then that i turned around to notice all the forest surrounding us was drowned in water the huge concrete ring was an island in an ocean of swimming trees outside the ring all the forest was flooded and inside was a circular precipice it was like we were standing on the hoover dam if the dam was a circle in the middle of a drowning jungle rather than a blockaded river captain kidd put a hand on my shoulder to steady my nerves whistling he went to the badly dilapidated very narrow stairway that led along the wall down into the subterranean shuttle grounds i followed him william coming after me then don this time it was ozzy bringing up the rear the walk was long and all the while water drained from the chasm i could see the whole shuttle by then all the shuttles looked the same to me and this one looked like all the rest the only difference was this example well it looked fake for one thing water was pouring out from between the metal panels on its wings jetting out from the little door near the cockpit and streaming from the massive bay doors a real shuttle would have to be air tight if this thing were in space all the air would suck out instantly and it wasn't just the cracks in its skin but the whole thing looked slightly off somehow it looked like a fantasy version of the real space shuttle but a fantasy from the early nineteen hundreds the basic proportions were right but the thing was made all wrong whatever kind of metal a space shuttle is made of probably aluminum or titanium except for the ceramic heat shields this one looked like heavy steel bolted together all down the white rocket boosters the curved metal panels were pocked with exposed bolt heads not smooth at all and another thing the seals around the windows although dirty were brass i was sure of it as the stairway led us winding down the towering perimeter wall i could read the moniker stenciled in black on the shuttle's right wing nautilus the name sounded familiar to me but i couldn't place it don provided the answer wasn't the nautilus a submarine in twenty thousand leagues under the sea you're right i said i guess that makes sense because the real space shuttles are named after important real life exploring ships yeah william agreed so why not name a fake underwater shuttle after a make-believe submarine it's not make-believe captain kidd said and we all kept walking the hole we were in i was beginning to think of it in a new way like it was the barrel of one of those massive nuclear cooling towers smelled of sewage drains after a heavy rain everything was wet including us owing to the florida summertime humidity and the still air inside the subterranean facility all around us everything dripped with condensation the stairway creaked 
Ducks flew over our heads, squawking, and below, the turtles were trying to figure out where their lake had gone. We reached the bottom of the steps, and I looked up. How odd the sight was, the gray walls towering far above to a perfect circle of bright blue sky. Again, the dizziness came to me, with the curving walls looming large overhead. The proportions were so unusual to my vision it was hard to look at. Standing atop the ring filled with water, I had guessed the structure to be a little over a hundred yards across, but now the circle of sky looked no wider than a dinner table. I supposed, if comparing the walls of concrete to a building, they were nearly the height of a skyscraper, only built downward instead of up. We were in the deepest basement I had ever heard of, especially in Florida where the water table is so high. That explained the pumps and all the drainage built into the place. With my feet planted firmly on the ground, finally the floor I'd been looking for, I could consider the Nautilus space shuttle and its purpose. What is this place? I asked. Captain Kidd turned to me. He too had been staring up at the circular patch of sky. The shuttle is how we get to the next level. Like a video game, Ozzy said. Don was gripping the shoulder straps of her book bag like a nervous parachute jumper. We're going to ride that thing? I could tell by her shaky voice she was remembering the same thing I was. The real space shuttle, the Challenger, blowing up in the sky just a few years prior. The whole country had stopped to observe the disastrous explosion in reverent, horrible awe. A TV had been wheeled into our classroom so kids could watch the lift off. Then it happened. Had we known what was coming, my teacher could have turned it off. Of course, she didn't know, and the event brought home the stark reality. Space travel was a risky business. Isn't that dangerous, I insisted, but Ozzy was grinning like an idiot and William not far behind. Captain Kidd followed a sidewalk around to a line of windows set into the wall. When he reached a yellow door, he tried the handle. He jiggled it. I heard Ozzy make a screeching sound, but too late, the captain was already twisting the knob. The door shut open with a roaring whoosh as a tidal wave engulfed him. He rocked backwards, water erupting around him. Had he not kept his grip on the door handle, he would have been washed away down the drain pipes like one of the turtles. When the room was empty, Captain Kidd spat out a mouthful of murky water. He was soaked, his brown hair streaking over his eyes. Then he laughed. Should have seen that coming. I tried to warn you, Ozzy said. A fish swam by the window, but that's all right. I needed a bath anyway. Captain Kidd rested his rifle against the wall and let his huge, sodden army backpack, the one with shark teeth dangling from the leather shoulder straps, fall in the puddle at his feet. With his clothes drenched and clinging to him, I saw how skinny he was. He went to the open door, rubbing his chin. I doubt any of these computers work. As he said this, I noticed a sign above the door, Mission Control. We went into the open room. Just beyond the threshold, a catfish flopped on the floor. We um, scooped it up, pushed past Don and Ozzy, and chucked it into one of the pools still disappearing down the drains. With that done, we returned our attention to the control room. Inside were row after row of computers, all set up to allow users to face the algae-tinted windows. Ozzy went to one, running his fingers across the keyboard. It's fried, I guarantee it. He was right. The whole room looked salvaged from the bottom of the ocean. No way the computers would work. Captain Kidd rolled a chair out from behind the desk, plopping down in the wet sponge seat. He tried a power button on the CPU. There was a click, but nothing else. He scooted his chair to the left and tried another with similar results. Doesn't matter. We'll make our calculations the old-fashioned way. At that moment, he looked even younger than my little brother, so it was strange to hear him speak with such authority. I won't lie to you, he said. This will be dangerous, but moving up the decks often is, especially this close to the top. He looked beyond the open door to the Nautilus poised atop the launch pad. The shuttle was held upright by huge clamps on its wings. If it looked abandoned before, now it appeared ready to leap into the air. Maybe that was only a trick of the sunlight gleaming off its wet skin, but I fancied the mist I saw beneath its engines was really smoke. 
As I turned to Captain Kidd again, he gestured with his chin. It takes a heap of explosives to lift an old bird like that one, but if my calculations are true and have some good help, I'm sure we can do it. He looked each of us in the eyes. What do you say? William and Ozzy were nodding their agreement, but Don said, You didn't answer Charles's question. The girl who took the patch ferry. Who is she? I had forgotten about that. Chapter 9 Castatine Captain Kidd rocked in his office chair as the rest of us gathered round him like he was our coach and this was game time. I supposed it was, and he would lead us, his title of captain seeming to fit him so naturally, though he looked no older than we were. Ozzy, William, and I sat on one of the long rows of desks, computer monitors between us that we were using for our armrests. Don set her backpack in one of the swivel chairs, dug out a big bag of Skittles, and passed them out, giving each of us a handful. I watched Captain Kidd examine the colorful candies before tasting one. Thank you, he said with a smile, then tossed the rest in his mouth all at once. I popped a selection of purples and yellows in my mouth, noticing the candy coloring had run off onto my sweaty fingers. Captain Kidd's hands, however, were totally clean, totally dry also. In fact, although he was as wet as humanly possible mere moments ago, now he was almost entirely dried out. Even the chair he sat upon looked dry, which was impossible. He looked off into the distance over our heads, his clean fingernails picking at a seam in the fabric of his seat cushion. She's called Castatine, he said. We knew each other a long time ago way up high in the rooftop of the world. What's that? Ozzy asked, his tone that of a boy who discovered some new marvel. The captain tilted his head, his expression even dreamier than before. It's the top of the reality deck, the top of everything. Remember, one side is blue, the other side is red. That's why they're called the red and blue decks. My skin was clammy, my stomach churned. What does that even mean? The captain shrugged. You'll know better if you see it. I wasn't sure I wanted to see it, or even if I could. Don leaned in. Explain it to us. Captain Kidd stroked his palms together. The movement seemed to produce heat, maybe even light. At the top of reality, there are two realms, as I've already told you. The blue side, where I'm from, is ruled by the blue king and the blue queen, royalty of the highest order. They are as wise as can be for any mortals, though they're practically immortal, and they're very great in law and beauty. Are they gods? Don asked. No, but they have great power. In any case, Castatine isn't from there. She's from the red, where the black unicorn reigns. Or at least he used to. What happened to him? Don asked. I don't know, but he no longer lives in the rooftop of the world. Now he lives in the red attic. My stomach clenched. Isn't that where we're going? The attic of the world? Yes, the captain said, but not to the red side. I hope not anyway. Was that supposed to be reassuring? I watched every movement of his face. But there are monsters in the blue side too? I mean, isn't that what you told us? Captain Kidd's lips tightened, his brow fidgeting, but his eyes, like amber crystals, were locked on mine. There are monsters in the blue side. That is true, but not Lord Nightmare. Don brought us back to the question at hand, the main question. Fine, she said. We'll get back to that in a minute if we have to, but how do you know Castatine? Captain Kidd studied Don's face, then looking to the rest of us, he said, in the rooftop of the world, where the red and blue decks meet, in between there's a place called the Gossamer Gardens. It's almost like Eden, I heard myself say. The captain looked at me. Sure, in a way it is. It's a very special place. His voice seemed to hum in my ears. There's a well in the garden where people come from all over to draw water and tell stories. At the well, sunlight plays tricks, the air is thin, and when the wind blows across the honeysuckle vines, all of life feels like fantasy. It's the best, he rubbed his cheek. That's where you met her, Don said. 
The captain nodded slowly. But the well in the gossamer gardens is no ordinary watering hole. It's the downward-facing door, the gateway from the rooftop into the attic of the world. We knew the place was unusual and somewhat restricted, and it was dangerous. Kids could get lost there. Our elders told us that many times. I watched the captain's changing expression. Boys, even magical ones, it seemed, were too curious for their own good and often went places they shouldn't. I was feeling that same way, sitting on the control room desk between a pair of dead computers, my friends all around me. We were in a place we had no business being contemplating heroics that would likely get us killed and for a purpose we didn't understand. The captain said, Castatine and I would gather water in buckets lowered down on ropes, but also... We would look into the unknown darkness and smell its strange perfumes and listen to its music. William swallowed his candies. You could hear the music from other worlds? He always was interested in music. The captain nodded. Don whispered, and Castatine fell in, didn't she, like Tiki Tiki Timbo down the well? The captain sighed, giving her another of those sad smiles. That's right. I tried to save her. I climbed down with a rope. But that was a problem. At the time, I didn't understand the doorways, that the water would take her to the red deck below. But the rope would take me to the blue side, and I didn't realize how difficult it would be to get back up. Considering the green skittles in my damp palm, I said, You were like Jack with a pocket full of magic beans, but you didn't know how to use them. I guess so, the captain agreed. In any case, I lost her. He sat forward, taking off his hat and hiding his face in a hand. What could we say? Distantly, I heard the old pipes on the floor grumble. Water oozed from sagging ceiling tiles and drizzled down the walls in filthy trickles. Don had moved in close to the young captain. She stood over him, and when she stroked the back of his head, he looked up at her. What was she like? she asked. Don had seen Castatine in our neighborhood, was apparently frightened by her, but the fear she'd shown before, or maybe it was just a case of the heebie-jeebies, was gone now. Now she was brightened with the affectation of a girl who smells romance in the air. Don was probably imagining a tragic love story, a young girl with a head full of dreams betrayed by her own sweet passions. Yet I pictured someone entirely different. I imagined a creature of broken purpose, like a vampire. In my mind, Castatine had bloodless pale skin and big, dark eyes. I saw white fangs behind grinning red lips. She was evil to the core. She'd tricked the young captain into using the rope. It was a trap. After all, she'd used a snare to catch the patch fairy. Captain Kidd lowered his head again. She was funny. I remember that. And she was pretty in her own weird way. She had deep eyes. Also, she was so carefree. Everything was play to her. No matter what I said, she'd laugh. But she was... He reached for the right word. She was wayward. You mean she was naughty? I asked. I mean she had something wrong with her heart. Captain Kidd sat a little straighter. She thought grown-ups were all fools and made fun of everyone in authority, even the king. And she courted danger. She would climb up onto the stone lip of the well and twirl around the post. Her little black flats were always slipping on the rocks, but that only made her giggle. When I'd tell her to stop, to get down, she'd lean back over the pit and threaten to toss herself in. And sometimes she'd jump from one side to the other, daring me to catch her. He'd already told us the outcome of her carelessness. She'd fallen in. Don grimaced. Did you ever find her? No. By the time I made my way into the red attic, she was already in the service of that land's king. The black unicorn, Don said. I remembered the warning that the attic of the world was full of monsters. I stood up. Look, Captain, I'm sorry about the fairy and all. I really am. But you have the wrong kids. Whatever you're planning, it's too much. We have to get home to our families. Don caught my hand, but I pulled it free, looking to my friends. Seriously, guys, this is all super weird and interesting, but what will our moms think when that rocket blows up in the air above the neighborhood and none of us are seen again? Ozzy glared at me. Come on, this is once in a lifetime. You're going to ruin it. William leaned forward, his elbows on his knees. Maybe Charles is right. 
He said this as if the admonition was painful. Ozzy threw up his hands. Don't be ridiculous. It's not going to blow up, will it? We all looked at the captain. Well, Don asked. It could, the captain admitted. Don studied him. But it's worth the risk? It is, he said. She was looking at him with an intensity I'd never seen before. Why? Captain Kidd got to his feet, straightening his vest. Because the Patch Ferry is worth saving. In a world full of worries, people need to know someone good is watching. He placed a hand on Ozzy's shoulder. Besides, haven't you ever wanted to ride a rocket? He looked to William. To see a world anew in all of its wonders? Then to me. And if monsters creep in dark places, don't you want to know how many heads they have? Strangely, I did. But would it matter what we learned, or what amazing sights we saw, if we were eaten in the process? The captain twirled his hat back onto his head and tugged the glossy black brim. Who's with me? Ozzy stood at once. Then William slowly slipped off the desk and stepped forward. Don looked to me. Charles, what about you? I could see in her eyes that she was going, but she wanted me to come with her. What kind of friend was I? What kind of leader? If I let them go without me into danger? I looked at the captain. Undeniably, he seemed to know what he was doing. The cap he wore fit him perfectly, not only in size, but in purpose. Yet... I would not go for him, not even close. And I would not go for some unknown fairy, even if she was a princess from some highway land. But for my friends, yes, I would go for them. There you have it. Chapter 9 is at its end, which means we're done for the day. But don't worry, we're not done with the story, not even close. So tune in for the next episode, because Charles and his friends are about to begin launch preparations. I want to hear how that turns out, don't you? And Castatine, hmm, what a curious character that is. What do you think she's up to? Nothing good, I assure you. If you want to contact me with feedback on the show, or if you have questions, you can email me, joseph at thebluedeck.com, or contact me through Twitter, at Joseph Mazrak. That's J-O-S-E-P-H-M-A-Z-E-R-A-C. Links are in the show notes. Please remember to rate the show. I always read reviews. So far, we're a five-star podcast, and that's thanks to you. This concludes the first season of the Blue Deck Podcast. Thanks for listening.